Welcome to Teaching the Truth with Pastor Eric C. Bogan. Clearly define what I am to do. Let every word penetrate the heart. Let what is said lead them running to your arms. Use me, Lord. Use me, Lord. I entitled this particular sermon. This dream, you know, these dreams, when I get them, they don't have any titles. They just say, Pastor, I saw this in Jesus' name. And so, but I'm, I'm putting a title on this dream, on this sermon, and I'm calling it Road Trip. Road Trip. Here's the dream. It starts out this way. It says, in this dream, me, and the me here is Zaporia Bell. Bell Johnson, you know, Zipporah has been here a very long time. And, and let me just say this before I get going. I don't normally reveal the name of dreams or the people who give me these dreams. I try to keep their names anonymous um, because I just don't want people going up to them. Child, can you interpret my... No, st- calm down. Stop. Stop. Do it. Don't do that. Amen. So I, I try to, if I can, to keep their name anonymous because I want to hear what some people have to say. I want to hear their dreams. Sometimes, you know, dreams are, are, are just the tacos you had last night, in Jesus' name. <laughs> Sometimes they're individual. I mean, I've received dreams. People have sent me dreams and said, well, this isn't for the church. This is for you. And, and they said, oh, my. Yeah, I said, oh, yes. And so I had to share that with them. But I want people to send them, but I don't want them to be afraid that their name is um, revealed, and so I had to get Zipporah's um, permission, and she said, yeah, Pastor, you go ahead. But I'm only revealing her name this time because as we go on, you're going to see that her name, along with the other people she mentioned in this dream, their names are important to the meaning that's in this dream. Amen? So that's the only reason. So let's get back to it again. This dream, in this dream, she tells me that she, Zaporia, and Sharita, and Duke. How many remember Duke? I was m- married to Gretchen years ago. He says, well, I don't remember Duke. Can I? You, don't, you don't have to remember Duke. Amen. It's just, that was just for those people who do remember. So it's Zaporia, Sharita, and Duke were all traveling in a car. And at some point, Bishop Bogan. How many remember Bishop Bogan? <laughs> Bishop Bogan came to the car and noticed, greeted the whole congregation. But it was only us in the car. Zaporia, Sharita, Duke, and Bishop Bogan. I believe these four individuals represent everyone who will be or who is a part of the church and will be a part of the church in the end time. A lot of, this, a lot of what's in this dream is associated with the end times. And uh, the names of each of these four individuals actually represents a different category of people that's going to be in the church or represented by the church in the last days. Each one of their names represent a different class of people that will be in the church. Now, we don't have time to go through all their names in this sermon, but I'm just saying that because after today, we're going to start moving in and I'm going to start talking to you about the end times. Amen. Some of you are unfamiliar with the end times, but how many know we're getting closer to the end? And I want us to be familiar. I want us to be educated in the events, the things that will take place in the end times, because if you're not aware, you can find yourself fighting God and not know it. So I want us to be aware. You're welcome. Amen. So we we will be talking about that and we will get into... um, the meaning of these names and, uh, and how they represent these different class of people. But I want you to see here that everybody in this car is the church. Even though this car isn't filled with millions of people, it's only filled with four people. These four people represents the whole congregation, the whole con- Everybody get that? Let's move on. The the dream continues. It says, Duke was standing up in the car. Must be some car. Standing up in the car, and he was preaching like Bishop Bogan. We were traveling to a church that was located on Martin Luther King or the old Detroit Street. 
How many remember when Martin Luther King was called Detroit Streets? So this car that contained the whole congregation, not just this congregation, but God's church, they were traveling in the car, and one of the people in the car was up preaching. So we already know what kind of trip this is, what kind of road trip this is. It's an evangelistic trip. They're being sent out to preach and proclaim the gospel. Only they're not being sent into the world. They're being sent to a church. Ah, see, now we're beginning to see that in the last days, the people that's going to need the evangelizing is folk right in the church. How many remember when Jesus came and walked the earth? He says, I've been sent to the world. No, to the lost sheep of the house. of it. Some folk are in the house lost. Say lost in the house. I remember as a child, I, I went, we were a bunch of my cousins and I, we went out and uh, we had a few adults with us, but we went out to one of those, you know, carnivals they have, you know, in the neighborhood. And I got lost in the carnival. But there's some folk who are lost right here in God's house. And God's going to be in the last days sending the church to the church in order to encourage those in the church to repent. So everybody in church ain't saved. I know that's a shocker to some people. You could be backslidden right in the pews on the outside looking in. I wish I got an amen. amen. So it says here that, you know, they were headed to a church that was located on Martin Luther King or the old Detroit Street. I did some research, found out that the name Detroit, the city Detroit, comes, has a French origin, and it means narrow or straight. It's, it's, it, it's taken from the fact that Detroit actually is located along a narrow passage of water. The Detroit River, the narrow passage of water. Detroit sits on a narrow passage of water, um, and, or that's also called a straight. Not straight as in non-crooked, but straight as in narrow. And when you look those words straight and narrow up in Scripture, both words are associated and mean tribulation. The fact that this church is on Detroit Street, I believe it's saying that this church is headed to tribulation. Mm, there's some people headed to tribulation. Go with me to Revelations chapter 2. Here in Revelations 2, uh, this is an epistle written by the Apostle John, and he wrote this epistle to churches, to churches that were um, present in his day. And this particular part of his letter, he's writing to the church of Thyatira. And notice in Revelations 2 and verse 20, notice what it says, notwithstanding, and God is speaking here through the apostles. So this is Jesus speaking. He says, notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee. How I many know oh God, God has a few things against us? He says, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. I gave her space to repent of her fornication, but she repented not. Verse 22, behold, I will cast her into a bed, a bed of affliction, sickness. And them, notice, and them that commit adultery with her into great, what? Tribulation, Tribulation except they repent of their deeds. 
Notice here, God is threatening to cast this church into great tribulation if they don't repent. This is a message we don't hear enough in the body of Christ. We think the only time that we should hear a message of repentance is when we have tent revivals in the park. And we're commanding the unbeliever, God says repent, or the folks that stand outside the, uh, 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 the arenas, the ball games, you know, with the big bullhorns. You need to repent. Jesus is coming again. We need to bring those bullhorns right in the church. According to this verse, those same bullhorns need to be uh, in the church, and we need to be commanding people right here to repent. And why was God requiring them to repent? He says, because they were suffering that woman Jezebel. They were suffering. They were permitting. They were, uh, 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 that's when you allow somebody to do what they please without correcting or stopping it. You, they were suffering a woman who had the spirit of Jezebel. This is not the Jezebel of the Old Testament that was married to Ahab, but it's someone with that same spirit. How many know that same spirit is present today? And here we see that this spirit was influencing the church in John's day. And he says that because they were permitting this spirit of Jezebel uh, 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 to, to seduce and teach God's people, notice, to commit fornication and eat being sacrificed to idols. You know, there is a spirit that's in the church that's making believers think that it's okay to be immoral. That's making immorality, it's not a big deal. Huh? It's not a big deal. You know, let people love who they want to love. It's not a big deal. It, it ain't bothering me none. I don't see the big deal. See, you see this? And some of you say, me neither. That's a sign that we're being leavened. I said it's a sign that we're being leavened. And, and if we're not committing fornication, which there's a whole lot right in the body of Christ, if we're not the ones guilty of committing immorality and fornication, he says, we're also being taught to eat things sacrificed to idols. I don't know if you, if you understand what he means by that. To eat things sacrificed to idols means to commit evil acts indirectly. Paul wrote a letter to the Corinthian church, and he was rebuking them for going to feasts in honor of idols. And in those feasts, they were eating meats that were sacrificed to idols. Now, they weren't, they weren't involved in the actual rites of idolatrous worship, but they were present. They were among them. And because they were among them, Paul says they were just as guilty indirectly. You know, sometimes we can be guilty because of the people that we associate with. How many know our silence is given permission? Because we show up, we're given permission. And, I'm, and he's saying here that's leavening, that's, that's, that's causing our church to be uh, that church, that part of the segment of the body of Christ that God is threatening to cast into tribulation. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Somebody say guilty by association. See, we think it's nothing wrong with it. I got all kind of friends. Well, you know, we, we, we fellowship with them. We, we endorse them. There's no conviction whenever they're around us. And we think, that, we think that's, that's being godly. We, we think because we're tolerant of these things and people's conscience isn't arrested around us, that that's a good thing. How I many know there used to be a day when saints used to convict you? I mean, just riding on the train with them would make you, you know, you would you'd be like, you know, 
You see the saints get on the train because they headed to church. Everybody, you know, they, they put, they, they start, you know, move the bottle underneath them. You know, they just. How many remember the day when you used to ride down the street with your, with your worldly music, but as you came up on the church, what would you do? You turned it down when you crossed the street. You say, in oh, Jesus' name, oh, one more see. And then as soon as you passed it, you turned it back up. How many remember that? Huh? I said, how many of that? How many remember before you went in in church, you tucked your shirt in your pants? You took your hat off. Now they come in, they got the hat on. They even singing with the hat on. It's just, it's just, no, it's just no reverence. It's just it's not a big deal. Somebody say, that's a problem. That's a sign. It's a sign that we on Detroit Street. We headed to trouble. How many ever been on Detroit Street? Oh, it's trouble over there. <laughs> it's, Detroit Street. it's trouble on Detroit Street. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, have you found it? 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 1. It is reported commonly, it's common, that there is fornication among you. Again, folk in the church, such fornication as is not so much named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. Verse 2, and you're puffed up about it. And have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be what? Taken away from among. No, no, no. Come, bring me. Just keep coming. Keep singing in the choir. Keep playing on the instruments. Keep serving on the usher board. Keep, keep volunteering back there with the children. We don't just keep on. It's all right. It's all right. He says, you should be praying that we don't want them among us. People who will say blatant, say without shame. We're not talking about folk who, who trying to live right and, and, and looking for God to give them the resources and the tools and the weapons how to live righteous and holy. We're talking about people with an I don't care attitude. We should be praying that God get rid of I don't care folk away from us. People with no fear of God. Oh, no, we don't want them among us. We, we, we invite them. He goes on to say, verse 6. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leavens part the whole lump. A little leaven does what? Leaven the. Paul is pointing out here that the Corinthians were being very tolerant of this man who was again in fornication and had no shame about it. I mean, came in with his father's wife and sit with his arm around her in church, daring somebody to say something. Huh? He says, your tolerance of this kind of behavior in your midst, you think it's a good thing, you're puffed up about it, but it's not. He says, it's actually leavening you. It's corrupting you. I said, it's corrupting you. Not only is it corrupting you, but it's also causing you to be judged by God. You're under the threat of judgment. Look at the very next verse, verse 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a what? Sometimes you're not going to be saved until you get rid of the old, some old friends. Sometimes to be a new creature in Christ, you got to get rid of the old. Why am I, why, why am I unable? Why am I, my walk with the Lord is so up and down? It's because you keep hanging out with the down. You got to get rid of the old leaven that you may be a what? New lump. Let's keep reading. Notice. As you are unleavened, for even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. As I said, in just a few minutes, we're going to be sharing of the communion table. I mean, no, communion represents our Passover. Huh? Christ, 
His death, his sacrifice is our Passover. And I don't know if you know anything about Passover, but Passover is what delivered God's people from judgment. Passover wasn't just a, a holiday. Passover wasn't just a, a feast that they celebrated, you know, once a year with all the church folk. Passover, when it was first instituted, actually delivered God's people from the death angel, from the plague that was in Egypt. And how many know this, that when you have leaven among you, it causes the blessing of the Passover to be void. If you read the story in the Exodus about how the children of Israel were delivered from the death angel, how it passed over them, not only were they required to put blood over the doorposts, but they were also required to take all the leaven out of their houses. And if they forgot to do any of those things, they would have been judged just like the Egyptian. I'm telling you today, say I'm listening. There is a plague that is coming to our, our land. You thought corona was something. There's something even worse that's coming to our land. But I'm going to tell you this. There are going to be many in the body of Christ that's going to lose their life, not because they don't have a Passover, because they got leaven. And leaven isn't just you committing sin. Leaven is that mentality that you're tolerant. It's not a big deal. You used to be more convicted about sin. Now anything can go on in front of your face and it's like it's no big deal. You can see why now God is sending these messengers. <laughs> He's sending messengers. I need you to preach to my people. You know, God told Jeremiah, he said, Jeremiah, go stand outside of my house. Okay, and what do you want me to preach? I want you to preach the temple of the Lord. The temple of the Lord are these if you depart from your e evil ways, you shall enter into the temple of the Lord. So he was telling folk who was coming into the temple, if you really wanted to enter into the temple, you need to repent. That's a telling you, man. And I'm telling you, this word is going forth here today because God says y'all on Detroit Street and headed to tribulation. He's trying to bring deliverance. Now, the thing about leaven, say I'm listening. The thing about leaven, it doesn't just come from false prophets within the church. Remember, we just read in Revelation how this Jezebel spirit, a false prophetess, was seducing, deceiving God's people to be accepted of fornication and eating things sacrificed to idols. And there are a bunch of preachers out there that's helping to corrupt God's people by ma making them feel, oh, it's not a big deal. Uh, stop going to that church. That church, you know, they, they, they make a big deal. It's not a big deal about that. I, I actually had a group of students who, after they graduated, they went to college, and they were in another state. And um, they start they were asked they start going to a church out there because I mean these these young people before they left were on fire for God, and so they went out to this uh, church in the other state and they start going to church and and uh, because we produce real good children you know young people uh, the folk at that church saw the giftings on their life they they start using them in the area of of, of ministry volunteering they're like oh man y'all got something on y'all and so they were being you and so all the staff members went out to eat. After one big event, they, so they were all out to eat, hanging out, and they were all just getting drunk, talking under each other's clothes. He said, they, they called me and my wife the next day, they say, y'all going to have to pray for us because 
He said, me and this other person, they went down there, we've been on a fast because we are around. I mean, these folk in here ain't saved. Hmm. So you could be corrupted right in church. Leaven, you can be leavened right in the pews, but there's something about leaven. It don't just come from within the church. It can come from outside the church. I said it can come from outside the church. Go to Mark chapter 8. I'm going to show you. Yeah, sometimes you get leavened by people outside the church. Mark 8. I need you to hear me, church. I need you to hear me on this. This is the word of the Lord to us. Hmm? You got you to gotta know why God sends you visions and dreams. Because there's something on the horizon. And he wants to deliver. First come a warning. Then destruction. See, when God gives you the dream, it's because he's trying to be more specific. Because how many you know the, the Bible doesn't have specifics? It just talks generally about God and righteousness and godliness. And sometimes we're not putting it all together. How many know what I mean by that? We're not reading between the lines. So, so God says, okay, since you're not reading between the lines, let me just be frank. That's why many times dreams and visions will come. So that's God's opportunity to be frank with you because we're getting close to something. So that's why I want you to listen. Okay, Mark 8, verse 14. Have you found it? Mark 8 and 14. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread. Neither had they in the ship with them more than one loaf. Verse 15, and he charged them, that is Jesus charged them, warned them even, saying, take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the leaven of Herod. Oh, notice, Jesus identifies two classes of leaven in this verse. The leaven of the Pharisees, and be careful of the leaven of Herod. We know, and don't take us long to figure out what the leaven of Pharisees is. This is leaven in the church, false doctrine, legalism, whatever that might be. But what's the leaven of Herod? Last time I checked, Herod, Herod was no preacher. Herod was a government leader. The name Herod actually means hero. The name Herod means hero. So what Jesus is actually pointing out here is that there is a hero leaven in the church. A hero is someone that you look to because of their outstanding acts in order to save you. Individuals you put your trust in. And Jesus is saying here to his disciples that I'm sensing a hero leaven inside of you where you have stopped looking to God for help and now you're trusting in systems, you're trusting in governments, you're trusting in people, influential people, popular people in order to save you. And I'm saying this is happening today. In fact, this is the reason why I believe in the dream the church was not only located on Detroit Street, it was also located on Martin Luther King. And Martin Luther King is a hero to so many people, not only in America, but right here in the woods, in the church. And notice what Jesus said. Notice the context. The disciples were being affected how they responded to this crisis of having no bread. And Jesus says, what's influencing your anxiety is not just a leaven of Pharisees, but it is a leaven of Herod. When you have a certain mentality where you look to people to save you, it will affect how you respond to crisis. The church today is insanity. They're responding to the crises in our in our, in our country like folk who ain't even saved. 
They're looking to government to give them health care free insulin when God says, I've healed you. Why do you care what they offer? That should not even be your concern. You, you should not be motivated by people who are offering you handouts at the medical center because you have a Passover. You have a lamb. But because you've been leavened, you forgot that. You're, you're looking for people to hand you a new check when your God says, I will supply all your needs according to his riches. The reason why that doesn't matter to you, the reason why you are going for and being seduced by all kind of nonsense is because you've been leavened. And God says, my God, do you not know, and we're talking about this, that in the last days, you will not be able to buy nor sell without a mark. Meaning, unless you dance their dance, no more handouts. There was a reason why God called Israel out of Egypt to the wilderness to teach them that he supplies without any pharmacy, without any Kroger, without any credit union, bread out of heaven, water out of a rock. I know we think these are just Sunday school lessons. We, we think they're just, oh, they're just stuff, you know, you read when you're a kid in, in Sunday school. No, God is teaching us something. We've lost this respect of God's mighty power we no longer look to him for salvation and deliverance. We got our little heroes. God says, you need to repent. Forgive me, Lord. You know, when, when, when it's time to eat, you'll go just for just about anything, just to eat. And that's what we've done. We've gone for just about anything. That's why they say, never go to the grocery store hungry. Yes, you ever heard that? Yes, sir. You'll start buying stuff. Ooh, let me, let me get some of these tweakies. And, oh, you'd, be, you'd be like, I don't even eat these. You'd put all kind of stuff in your basket. You'd be like, child, why did I buy this stuff? Because, say, thirsty. I was thirsty. Thirsty. And we... The things we tolerate, we co-sign. It's because we feel like if we don't do it, we won't. We, we, we won't not just not fit in, we, we won't eat. We will die prematurely. So we say, well, I know this, but, you know, they are offering some really good plans. Hmm. You hear me? Yeah, I, I see. It's important. Say I'm listening. So, you know, I, I'm going to just give you, I'm going to, because I know y'all think, oh, see, this is my past. Oh, my God, here come, here he come. <laughs> see, this is the reason why God put this in a dream. That this wasn't pastor sitting down and says, oh, well, how can I uh, influence the folk today? No. God put it in somebody else. He put the word in someone else. He put it inside someone else so, so that there can be no gainsaying. That pastor's on an agenda. No, nah, God's on an agenda. Can you see this? This is the point of prophecy. Prophecy ends all talk. That this ain't a man speaking, this is God speaking. So you do what you want to with it. Amen. Let them who have ears, what? Hear what the Spirit is saying. The dream goes on. Let me, let me end this. The dream goes on. Before we arrived at the church, we all agreed not to go to the basement. Don't go to the basement. In fact, we were specifically told, stay away from the basement. What's a basement? The basement is that part of the house that's still underground. Basements is an underground, an 
underground room, underground room. In this dream, the basement represents the worldly church. That segment of the church, that segment of Christianity that's still in the kingdom of darkness. That's still walking according to the course of this world. Ephesians chapter 2, basement. It's a bunch of basement saints. Still ain't come out the world. You're still in the basement. Basement. <laughs> Some of you may remember, you know, a few years ago, I think it was 2021, someone had given me a dream and I interpreted it. And, and, and the dream, uh, there were a lot of parts of it, but part of the dream was there was a bunch of bombs throughout the church. And we were sent inside the church to disarm them. And we were able to disarm all the bombs except for the one in the basement. They said, don't go in the basement. Leave the one in the basement alone. Leave the, leave the bomb in the basement alone. And we found out that that meant that there is coming a deception out of the pit of hell that you won't be able to disarm. It's going to happen. It's going to go off. God's going to send it. And it's coming out of the pit of hell. Don't try to go down there and tinkling with your little, you know, screwdriver, blue, red. No, it's, you, you, no. You, you can't disarm that one. How many know some folk you can't help? You can't help a brother be saved who don't want to be saved. Yeah. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, Ephesians 2 and verse 1, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein times past you walked or used to walk according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that still work until this day in the children of what? The children of disobedience are the children who live in the basement. People still walking according to the course of this world. And again, these individuals, we're not going to be able to help. You know, we're, we're trying to preach the gospel to the wrong people. We're trying to convince folk who won't be convinced that, man, this may not be good. We're... we're we're speaking till we're blue in the face, not knowing that you're talking to folk in the basement. Stay out the basement. Find the people who have ears to hear. People who are just being deceived but want to get out. And I'm going to tell you this. You keep trying to go among those individuals who are in the basement and they're going to leaven you. I said they're going to leaven you. And that's what has happened for many of us. First Corinthians chapter 15, we're being, we've been leavened because we thought we're going to save the world. You're not going to save the world. You're going to save people out the world, but you're never going to save the world. I know. That's news to some of us. You're never going to save everybody. You've got to find them who have ears to hear. And you better be careful I'm going to come over here because I'm going to save them. Yeah, you're going to end up being leavened. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33, be not deceived. Evil communications, what? Corrupt good manners. And that's what normally happens. It, it rarely happens in the opposite. It rarely happens that good people, you know, convert bad people. What ends up happening is bad folks end up corrupting the good ones. And, and I know you think you're strong. I've been in, a, I've been in God a long time. I, yeah, you're, you got a little old light. My little light shine. You're going to be like the big, going to blow your little light out. Oh, in the name of Jesus. My little light shine. They go, you're going to blow your little light out. Amen. Corrupt good manners. 
The, the dream goes on. Amen. The dream goes on. When I arrived at the church, they tried to send me to the basement. So they, 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 they finally got to their destination. And so when they went in there to speak to these people, guess what they try to do? They, uh, go to the basement. They try to send them to the basement. But I refuse. Good for you. Good for you. But they said to me, are you listening? They said to me, other people have already gone to the basement. And they began naming different celebrities, people of influence like John Legend and CeeLo Green. See, this is what they do, right? When we say, oh, no, I, I'm not for that. They say, do you, you know who else is endorsing us? And they start name dropping. Yeah, for real? Well, it must be okay then. It must be all right then. And the reason why we say it must be okay, it must be all right when they name drop, because we're leavened with this hero worship, this celebrityism. It matters to us what legend thinks, what CeeLo thinks. They're changing our opinion, but it's a sign that we've been leavened. Leaven. The name legend or John legend, the, the, the word legend refers to a very famous person, a superstar. The name CeeLo is actually short for Carlo. CeeLo, his, his, his real name is DiCarlo. And so CeeLo is, is an abbreviation for Carlo, C-Lo, Carlo, CeeLo. So that's what it's short for. It's short for Carlo. Well, did you know that the name Carlo throughout history has been an influential name and has shaped all kind of politics and, and leaders throughout this entire world, particularly in the European world? The Bourbon family, some of you may have heard of that. They have a, a lot of Carlos that have been very influential. And when you look this name up, it means a man who was influential. And so John Legend, this superstar, famous person, plus CeeLo, just represents the kinds of people that the worldly church, the basement church, uses to convince us to give in to its demands, to leaven us. And I'm telling you, watch out for the name droppers. In fact, some of us need to be praying, Lord, deliver me from people. Deliver me from celebrities. You know, we, we got some, some celebrities that we're just fans of. They can murder somebody and point blank. We say, oh, you don't understand. That person went off on them. And I, I, I understand it. I, I don't blame them. And then somebody else can be jaywalking. Oh, throw him under the prison in Jesus' name. Oh, no, no, no. Take the, oh, no, the death penalty, you know, because we're fans. Amen? And I'm saying before we leave here today, we need to be asking God, Lord. The saints of old used to pray, if anything in me is not right, take it out. Take it out of my house. See, the nature of leaven is it's really small and it often goes unhidden. I said the nature of leaven is it's not large, it's not something, it's really small and it's often hidden. It goes unnoticed. But the thing about leaven is once the process of leavening begins, it's almost impossible to stop. So you need to be asking, Lord, take out anything that's not like you, Lord. How many don't want anything in, in you that's, that's influencing you <clears throat> in a negative way without your knowledge? You're going off on people and don't even realize that you've been leavened with something. Amen, church. Amen. We're almost ending here. We're gonna, it, it says in the dream, it says, I decided to leave this church and go home. You should be turning home. As I left the church, I noticed that I had on high heel shoes. So I thought to myself, my feet will start hurting the more I walk in these shoes. So I decided that when this happened, I would simply take them off. After this, I noticed that instead of walking south towards home, I was walking north. And I woke up. 
So what we see here, and this is the, the last stanza here in this dream, is once she realized that she was unsuccessful to convert, she said, it's time to go home. And she began to leave this worldly church, and she noticed that as she left the worldly church, she had on high heel shoes. That tells us something about what it takes in order to come out from among them and be separate. You got to put on some high heels, meaning you got to elevate your walk. See, one of the reasons why, you know, ladies put on high heel shoes is to elevate themselves. To elevate that you, you rise up. And in order to come out from, you can't come out from among them uh, living like they live. You can't come out from among them walking like they walk. You got to elevate your walk. If you don't elevate your walk, you're going to stay. See, the worldly church is not geographical. Meaning it's not about you. You can leave a physical church and go to another church and still be in the worldly church. And that's why a lot of people are, are, are church hopping. They're trying to find where is a sanctified church. It's not, you can't see it. Jesus says the kingdom of heaven does not come by observation. It's inside of you. If you truly want to come out of a worldly church, you got to get out the flesh, number one. You got to stop judging things on the outwards. But to come out of this worldly church, because this church is headed for destruction. He says in Revelation, come out of her, my people, so that you won't be included in their judgment. How do we come out? You've got to elevate. Ephesians chapter 4, turn over there. And this is what the church is not doing. The church is not living an elevated uh, life. It's not walking an elevated walk. We're, we're acting like the world, behaving like the world, talking like the world. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their minds. Stop walking like the other Gentiles. Stop walking like the world. The world tolerates it. The, to the world, it's not a big deal. But how many know we've got to be a difference? we got to say, oh, but that is a problem. That's an issue. That's an issue. It's an issue with me. We stop making morality and righteousness and godliness an issue. It's no longer an issue for Christians. No, we don't even care. Our, our whole society is, is just going down because Christians who are supposed to be the salt stop caring. We don't care. We don't care. We don't care. We don't care. We don't care about, we don't care about if they do this. We don't care if they do that. None of that stuff matters to us. We don't care. Right, child, do whatever you want to. And we won't, there used to be a time when Christians used to, used to take a stand how many know what I mean by taking? We used to take a stand for things. We used to put on our shoes and take a stand. We don't take stands no more. We go like, y'all can go over there. I'm standing. Me and my house, we're standing over here. But here's the thing about the, about on the dream. She says, as she was walking, even though she was coming out that worldly church in the high heel shoes, she knew in her mind, oh, I won't be able to keep this up. My feet going to start hurting. But she made up in her mind that when they do, she'll just take off her shoes. And this is a warning to us that living this elevated walk, taking a stance, it's going to sometimes bring discomfort to your flesh. First Peter chapter 4. See, we want to be able to take a stand where it don't cost us nothing. No, it's going to, somebody say, it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt. It's going to hurt your corns. It's going to hurt those bunions. It's going to hurt your feet. Come on, ladies. You know, we're wearing them. Wear, look, wearing them shoes, them high heel shoes. You got to get your mind right because it's going to hurt. You don't wear them for comfort. How many know you don't? They don't wear high heel shoes for comfort. They wear it because they want to look a certain way. Because they certainly aren't comfortable. I'm going to tell you this. You can't walk with God for comfort. You can't live for Jesus for comfort. 
We got a bunch of Christians trying to maintain their comfort. You cannot live for Christ in comfort. It's going to cause discomfort to your flesh. It's going to be discomfort, yes. 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1. For as much then as Christ suffered for us in the flesh. Notice, get your mind right. Arm yourselves with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased. People that don't want to go through nothing are in sin. I'm telling you. Whenever you say, I'm not doing that, I already know you're in sin somewhere. Because to get out of sin, you got to be willing to put yourself in an uncomfortable position. Look at verse 4. Wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot. What? Speaking evil. That's the suffering. The suffering is when we stand over here. They're going to stand over here and think it's strange that you're not in the basement with them. Especially when all the famous people are down there. They go, you ain't down here? Your pastor down here? And he right there, I'm looking at him right now. Your, your pastor there? I guess you better than your pastor, huh? Oh my God. How long you been saved? Mmm, I see. Well, we all over here and you over there. And there are a lot of decisions we make because we standing by ourselves and ain't nobody else doing it. If, if it was a blind test, if it was a secret ballot, we would say a whole lot. But because everybody knows, uh, we end up going over here against our conscience. And I'm saying it's because we don't take serious that there's suffering in this walk. And it's not for the celebrity. It's not to please some flesh, but it's to please God. To please God. He says, whatever you do, do in the name of the Lord. Can you do that in the name of the Lord? There you go. It's a question. Yeah, it's a question. Can you do it in the name of the Lord? Hmm. Here's the last thing the Lord told me to tell you. He says, tell my people. Stop putting limits on what you're willing to do for my sake. I'll do it, but I ain't go do this. Don't say that. Do not. Never say what you won't do. I ain't never going to do this. I'll do this, but Lord, don't ask me to do that because I certainly ain't doing that. Because the moment you say that, according to the dream, the minute she said that, she stopped going home and started going in the wrong direction. Didn't even realize it. The moment she said what she wouldn't do, she was surprised because her home was south. And she started going north. You immediately start going in the wrong direction. Not when you go in the wrong direction, but when you make up in your mind what you're not going to do. You know what we should do? We should do what Christ did. When he was pressed to his limits, he says, Lord, not my will. When he felt like he couldn't go any further, he said, Lord, not my will. When he started considering the cup that he had to drink and, and the pain that would be associated with it, he says, Lord, not my will but let thy will be done. Stop telling God what you won't do. Say, Lord, let your will be. Everyone standing on your feet today, let your will be done. Hallelujah. We need to be careful, saints. How many realize we need to be careful in these last days? The decisions we make in these last moments 
are going to be paramount. Paramount to our salvation. Paramount to our deliverance. God wants us to start taking seriously our walk in our assignment. He says, come out of them, my people, and I will receive you. You don't have to worship at the feet of the masses. You have a savior. You don't need a hero. You don't need a deliverer. You have one. And if you have a hero, if you have a savior, then act like it. Don't let issues like that influence you. Instead, of, instead let God's issues influence you. What will be important to God? And if I got to stand all by myself, if I got to walk against the grain, then so be it. Because he went against the grain for me. I said he went against the grain for me. He suffered for me. Let us arm ourselves. Every head bow. Father, we pray today that you would search our hearts for any leaven any wickedness, any evil, any poison, any infection that has made its way into our hearts, that has made its way into our minds, that is contaminating us and influencing how we judge things and how we respond to crises, even the part that we don't even understand, Lord, Take it out in the name of Jesus. Father, we give you permission to take from us every working of the enemy, and all leaven, all iniquity, all evil. Father, we want to be right. We want to be saved. Oh, more than we want uh, to be liked, we want to be saved. We want to be whole. And give your people wisdom in these last days. Give us wisdom. And give us the courage to be righteous. To be holy. To take a stand. We've been seated in heavenly places. Let us walk in heavenly places. We've received the Spirit. Let us walk in the Spirit. Give us to band together. If, if we find no comfort, no friend in the world, let us find comfort among the faithful. Put it in the hearts of your people. Give us to do that which is pleasing in your sight. And Father, we repent. Uh, repent for anything we may have done to cause you displeasure or tempt you to cast us into a bed of affliction or into tribulation. Father, we repent. We turn our faces to you. We are your servant. Forgive our sin. Blot out our iniquity. Teach us how to walk in a way that's pleasing in your sight. We thank you for this. Now, Lord, search our hearts. If there be any strife, ah, any strife, any bitterness or disagreement with our brother, Father, we put it aside. We put it away. As we prepare to partake of the Lord's table, we, we do not want to come to this table in strife or in division. Father, we thank you for the love of God that is shed abroad in our hearts not just for the believer, but for all men. We receive that now in Jesus' name. Come on, go to three people. Tell them I love you with the love of God. Come on. If you haven't guessed it, this is your chance to make it right with somebody. <clears throat> skip over this. 
Don't skip over them. Go to them if you need to. Make it right. Tell them I love you with the love of God. All, tell them all is well. Come on, wives need to tell husbands all is well. Children, parents, friends, family, tell them all is well. All is well. I love you with the love of God. I love you with the love of God. I love you with the love of God. That's it. Praise God. Amen. Give me what to say. Let me hear you. Thank you for listening. If this teaching has been a blessing to you and you'd like to partner with our ministry to share the message of Jesus Christ, please visit our website at www.hmclive.org and click the donate button. If you're in our area, we invite you to join us at 4317 Lippincott Boulevard, Burton, Michigan, 48519. Harris Memorial, Church of God in Christ, teaching the truth and showing the love.